Uh, welcome to part four of uh, preparing for organic chemistry. Even more Lewis electron dot structures. Well, if you recall in the previous video, uh, we went through the Lewis electron dot structures for five formulas. And the last one we did was ozone, O3. And we worked this out and we got down to the very bottom and concluded that this was a valid Lewis electron dot structure for ozone, since all three oxygens have their octets satisfied. And that did require this electron transfer that again you see in this process. Now, the problem with this are these experimental facts that you see on the right. When you measure the structure of ozone experimentally, and there are various ways of doing that, you only see one unique oxygen, oxygen bond length. Now, if ozone is to have the Lewis structure and the bonding that is indicated in the lower panel, in the lowest panel, then you can see that that structure has an oxygen, oxygen single bond and an oxygen, oxygen double bond. And I think that you know that single bonds are longer than double bonds. They're certainly not the same in terms of geometry. And yet, experimentally, there's only one unique oxygen-oxygen bond length in ozone. Here's another experimental fact, which is a problem for our theory and our structure. When you calculate and measure the electrostatic potential, charge density on the three oxygens, you get uh, an electrostatic potential map that looks like what you see on the slide where the excess electron density on the terminal oxygens is identical, is identical. And again, when you look at the structure that we worked out in the very last bottom panel, only one of the oxygens has a full negative charge and the other one is neutral. So what's going on here? Well, if somehow we could say that ozone was both the Lewis electron dot structure on the left and the Lewis electron dot structure on the right at the same time, it would take care of these experimental facts that are inconsistent with, with ozone being only one of these two forms. And that's in fact what we, what we say and, and what we do when we encounter a molecule like ozone. We say that ozone is in fact a hybrid of these two forms with the left one contributing 50% and the right one contributing 50% to the overall description of the chemical species. And we call this resonance. In other words, for molecules like ozone and many others, Drawing one Lewis electron dot structure does not adequately represent the bonding and predicted behavior of that chemical species. And here you see the, the, the formal representation of ozone. Notice that there's a double headed arrow between the left hand Lewis electron dot structure and the right hand Lewis electron dot structure and there are brackets and this formalism is important. That double headed arrow must be there. That indicates that ozone is a resonance hybrid. This is the phenomenon in valence bond theory known as resonance, which was added on to address these difficulties with the theory and these deficiencies with the theory relative to experimental facts. The double-headed arrow is what's required here. If you don't put the double-headed arrow between the two structures, then you're implying a chemical transformation, A going to B. This is not a chemical transformation. This is the inadequacy, really, of the valence bond theory, which is a localized bonding model 
in representing species that really can't be represented by a localized bonding model, except we force the, the model to do so. And so we use the double-headed arrow when we say that ozone is a residence hybrid of 50% of the 50% on the left and 50% on the right. And we can draw one structure. And you can see that on the far right. And when we do that, each of the terminal oxygens has a charge of negative one half. Now, obviously, you can't have one half of an elementary charge. Um, right? You can't split an electron in half. Uh, however, you can talk about 50% charge density or extra charge density or charge deficiency. So you can have partial charges if you, can, if you consider that the charges are a, again, a electron probability density. And the picture on the right nicely shows that there is, in fact, only one OO bond length in ozone. Now let's look at the Lewis electron dot structure for the chemical species nitrate. This is the nitrate anion, NO3 minus, right? The conjugate base of nitric acid, HNO3. And so again, we go through the process. We start with the very top panel, but we have to add an electron. And we add an electron to one of the oxygens, being more electronegative than nitrogen. And we have nitrogen in the middle as the highest valence atom, just like before. We form one set of single bonds and we count and conclude that's not sufficient. We do the electron transfer trick in the fourth panel, and we end up with the structure at the very bottom, where there's one nitrogen-oxygen double bond and two nitrogen-oxygen single bonds. And those two oxygens in the single bonds have an extra electron each for a negative one charge. The central nitrogen has a positive formal charge, right, for an overall charge of minus one. Now, the problem with this is that, again, experimentally, there's only one nitrogen-oxygen bond length. You don't see a NO single bond and an NO double bond. You see one and only one nitrogen-oxygen bond length, which is equivalent for all three oxygens. You also, when you calculate the electrostatic potential, you see that each oxygen has a negative two-thirds electron density and note that three oxygens times negative two-thirds a piece is a total charge of negative two. Well uh, as with ozone the experimental facts can be uh, rationalized and made consistent with a valence bond theory if nitrate if the nitrate anion species is in fact a one-third, one-third, one-third hybrid of the three Lewis electron dot structure forms that you see on the slide. So what we say is that nitrate anion is represented, is best represented by three equally contributing resonance forms. Or again, if you want to show one picture, um, which is very useful in emphasizing that there's only one nitrogen oxygen bond length, all the oxygens are identical, then you draw the picture that you see on the bottom. Um, one thing I should mention here, I just refer to equally contributing resonance forms. Now for ozone, there are two that contribute 50-50. For nitrate, there are three that contribute 33.3% you know, a piece. Um, we're gonna see examples of molecules that um, have resonance, um, where resonance is required to fully describe the, the um, total chemical species, but where the different resonance forms have different bonding and therefore don't have the same energy and don't make the same contributions. So there can certainly be more significant and less significant resonance forms. Um, here are some basic uh, points or principles regarding resonance. If you want to think of these as the rules for resonance, you can. And uh, I'm going to let uh, you, the student, read these on your own. And, um, and then on the next slide, I'm going to, I've highlighted some of the really key um, take-home messages 
uh, within these these rules or or principles. And here they are. So the first point is that you must have an uninterrupted SP2 hybridized or SP hybridized bonded atomic system. And by uninterrupted, I mean, I mean you can't have any um, SP3 um, hybridized carbons or other types of atoms because SP3 hybridization uses all three p orbitals for the hybridization and resonance involves involves overlapping p orbitals you can see that in the rest of that statement so you can't have overlapping p orbitals if you've used all of them in your hybridization this is what we mean by uninterrupted sp2 or sp um, these these atoms or orbitals or really the p orbitals in these uninterrupted sp2 or sp bonded atoms must be coplanar if they're not coplanar they can't overlap they must be coplanar further down i've i've highlighted uh one more point here which is in general in general the more resonance forms you can write for a chemical species the more stable it is because the more resonance forms the more delocalized the overall bonding system or pi bonding system is. And, and so remember what we said at, in the first um, video here, we talked about very briefly the difference between valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory. We said that valence bond theory was a localized bonding model and it is. And so again, like I said earlier in this video, resonance is something that was kind of slapped on um, as, uh, as an addendum to valence bond theory so that it could treat delocalized systems. M molecular orbital theory is much more effective in treating delocalized systems, but resonance works well enough. In these final slides of this presentation, I show you some very typical uh, resonance systems. Um, I show you a two bonded, two bonded system a three bonded system and a four bonded system. So for two bonded atoms, what, what you see on the slide here is you see uh, what's called a carbocation. The carbocation is something that you're going to encounter over and over again in organic chemistry. It is an octet deficient six electron species. It's a reactive intermediate in many organic reaction mechanisms. It's not something that you can, you know, put on the, on the lab bench or put in a bottle generally, right? But it, it does figure prominently in reaction mechanism. And if you have a um, hetero atom being an oxygen or a nitrogen or a sulfur, or maybe even a bromine uh, with, in, with lone pairs or non-bonded electrons, uh, those lone pairs can reside in an unhybridized p orbital and can then overlap with the empty p orbital of the carbocation and they can stabilize that carbocation. So what you see here is oxygen stabilization of a carbocation and we invoke resonance. That's the double headed arrow. You see the red arrow and that is something that again, you're going to see over and over and you're going to use over and over and the red or the, it doesn't have to be red, but the, the arrow that starts from the electron pair and is moving towards the positive charge is a mechanistic arrow and it indicates the movement of a pair of electrons. So you can just imagine that that pair of electrons in that P orbital on oxygen is now moving in between the oxygen and the empty P orbital on the carbon to form the new double bond, which you see on the right. Now, this is a case where the two resonance forms do not contribute equally um, because the bonding is different in the two Lewis electron dot structures. And here is a, a, an example of a three bonded resonance, three bonded atoms. And this in fact is called the allylic system, allylic, A-L-L-Y-L-I-C. And uh, you, can, um, you can see the resonance for the allylic carbocation in the second um, uh, panel. You can see the resonance for the allylic radical. 
Notice that for the carbocation, we have that mechanistic arrow that is shifting the pi electrons uh, from carbons one and two to carbons two and three to generate, again, a equally contributing resonance form that has the same bonding and energetics. Uh, however, in the bottom panel for the radical, notice that arrow has only one hook. It's called the fish hook. We use the fish hook arrow to indicate the movement of one electron. So instead of an electron pair, we move one electron at a time, reform the double bond between carbons two and three, and then that leaves the radical on carbon one. Take a look at the very top panel. There's no resonance for that system. How come? Because carbon three has three hydrogens and is therefore an sp3 hybridized carbon. So without available p orbitals, since all the p orbitals are being used in the hybridization, there can be no resonance. And we indicate that with that slash. Um, here you see uh, four bonded resonance. Um, and the classical example is butadiene. That's the molecule below in the, in the lower panel, butadiene. And um, what you see is that, uh, again, we have uh, both the uh, Lewis electron order structure involving two double bonds uh, without formal charges. And then we have two other Lewis electron dot structures where we place a positive or a negative formal charge on carbons one and four. And again, uh, again, um, the, the second and third Lewis electron dot structure contribute equally because they do have equal bonding and equal charge distribution and uh, energetics, okay? But they contribute differently from the uh, first uh, Lewis electron dot structure where there is, uh, there are no formal charges assigned to any of the atoms. In the upper panel, you can see that if we have, if we have this molecule, which also has two, two double bonds, two alkenes, but because of that interrupting, that carbon three is an interrupting sp3 carbon, there is no resonance in that system. Okay, so in this last slide for this presentation, I show you something very interesting. If you remember, go. Go back earlier and look at the rules for resonance and you will see the coplanarity requirement, right? That all, P, all the p orbitals be in the same plane so that they can overlap. This makes sense. Now in the, in the, in the upper molecule, I show two molecules here um, and they're related, they're closely related. They're both derivatives of benzene. And in the upper molecule, you have a benzene ring with a dimethyl amino group on it. And that molecule enjoys resonance delocalization, stabilization, as is, as is indicated. And uh, that can be demonstrated in any number of ways, physical properties, spectroscopic properties and data, uh, reactivity. Um, and of course, the reason for that is that the lone pair on the nitrogen, which is not explicitly shown on the left-hand structure, can be coplanar with the six p orbitals from the six sp2 carbon atoms on the benzene ring. There's no reason why they can't be coplanar and being coplanar, they overlap and enjoy the resonance delocalization that you see indicated in the upper panel. Now look at the molecule below that. It's very closely related, except now we have methyl groups on carbons two and six of the benzene ring. And the right-hand picture shows you that, that, that the because you now have these methyl groups, those methyl groups interfere with the coplanarity requirement, right? So in other words, if the dimethyl nitrogen or amino group is to be coplanar with the dimethyl benzene ring, that requires that the methyls on the nitrogen be coplanar with the methyls on the benzene ring, because remember, sp2 hybridization is trigonal planar. And being in the same plane, they interfere with each other. You can see that that's indicated in that lower right hand picture with those curvy red lines. The purple arrow indicates that the nitrogen or the dimethyl amino group will rotate away from planarity to avoid that steric interaction, but that turns off resonance. And so this is called, in fact, steric inhibition of resonance or SIR. 
Um, and there are quite a few examples of this, and it's very interesting, but it does point out um, that uh, the requirement for coplanarity is a, is, a, is a real thing. So um, that's the end of this video, but I want to say one more thing in, in closing here. Um, there are five topics, of course, to this mini-series, and these are the five essential topics that, I, that I've emphasized uh, any student prior to actually taking their organic chemistry course or class uh, um, should have mastered. Um, and uh, the others uh, certainly fall into that category. And resonance I, I include here. However, resonance is special because it, it's, 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 a, it's a, a kind of a, a, a wiggly concept. It's, it's, it's much more difficult to, to, to teach and to understand than say acid-base theory or isomers. Um, and so this is something that, that will pop up uh, throughout the, the, the course of the, the subject, right? Uh, and your class, um, it, but to go into more detail uh, for our purposes in this uh, mini course is kind of beyond the scope of what we're doing, but this is something that you will continually uh, encounter and, um, and, and occasionally struggle to understand. I'm just going to be, be honest about it. All right, that's it for, for, for this.